Thank you for joining me today on A Walk in the Garden. I'm Liz Davey, and this series of garden and cooking shows is filmed at my house here in Norfolk and in my gardens. I have a variety of gardens, and I'm in my herb garden right now, which is where we off usually start this series. Right now, we haven't too much to do in the herb garden, except keep it watered if it doesn't rain. Lately, we've been getting quite a bit of rain uh, on a regular basis, so watering has not been too much of an issue. Now's the time we can pick the herbs and enjoy them. But since it is the end of August, it's time to start thinking about fall and winter, uh, not doing anything really yet much, except taking some cuttings. And a couple of the things I want to take cuttings from would include the scented geraniums, a nutmeg geranium and a peppermint geranium. They smell really good and they're nice plants to have in the herb garden. They come in a lot of different scents. Uh, rose is one of the more popular scents. Lemon, peppermint, nutmeg, a lot of different plants. Unfortunately, in our climate, they are not hardy. So if you want to continue to grow them, you need to either buy new ones every year or take cuttings. And I'm taking cuttings of these. I will also be taking cuttings of other annual, some of the other annual herbs like uh, some of the lemon herbs, the, the lemon verbena. And I may try to bring the lemongrass in entirely, although I haven't had great luck with that. And I will also bring in the pineapple sage as w cuttings, rather than bringing in the whole plant. Now I do have a few plants of uh, rosemary and bay that I left in pots all summer out in the garden and they will come in just as they are into the house later on. The bay probably a little earlier, it's starting to sunburn a little bit, and then the rosemary can stay out until the temperatures are down to almost 20 degrees. So it can stay out probably as far as November if we don't get some real low temperatures in before that, and we seldom do. So it can stay out a long time. We can pick sage to dry, and I will probably be doing that. And sage dries very easily, uh, and we'll have enough for our Thanksgiving stuffing very easily and more left over. But sage, basically you just hang it up in the kitchen or dining room or someplace where it can stay a little bit in the shade. You'll get better color and it won't be long, probably about a week before it's dried. You want to wait to pick herbs for drying until they've dried off in the morning. Lately we've been pretty humid and things haven't been very dry early, but you need to wait to pick them until they do dry. A lot of things, things are going to seed right now. The oregano, uh, I did pick that before it went to seed. Also the tarragon. I can still pick mint, which has not fully bloomed yet. We've got a few blooms, but not too many. And lemon verbena, of course. Let me take some cuttings of that since it's right here. We'll just make a little bouquet of those and carry it with us for a while. And then I'll show you what we do with the cuttings. You can also take cuttings of rosemary if you wish to uh, make new plants. Since, again, it is a tender perennial. It is perennial in some areas, but unfortunately not in New England. Now let's move over to the perennial garden and see what we can do over there. This area of the perennial garden is a little quieter during this season. Uh, we have more color as we move down the way. But this is when altering foliage, adding different foliage, helps to add some colorful foliage, variegated foliage, colorful foliage. So when you're planning and planting a garden, think about what you can add 
that will be attractive even when it isn't in bloom. I have some grasses in bloom in back, the uh, dark foliage of this one, and we have spiky foliage and little artemisia blooming, and it has a more lacy foliage. We're waiting for things like fall asters, which will add some color, Boltonia, which will also add color, and geraniums may bloom again or may not. A Montauk daisy uh, will come into its own in another month. Goldenrod, not quite in bloom, and of course all of the asters, the fall New England asters. So think about foliage when you plan your garden. I've got my clipboard out and what I want to do is take some notes. What do I need? What do I need to move in the garden? What do I need to uh, take out completely and get rid of because I don't like it anymore? What needs to be divided? Certainly those asters in the spring could stand to be divided. And what do I need to add? Perhaps I need to add something in here that will give a little more color during this season. Most of the plant catalogs that you can sign up for will show a season of bloom. So you want to look for things that will be kind of late summer to early autumn. And I could add something like that in this area. Moving down, we have a lot more color. The butterfly weed, which is a favorite of the monarch butterflies, is still blooming as it also goes to form seed pods that will go to seed. And I'm saving this because I would like it to go to seed so that I can collect those seeds and share them. A few roses, and we have some annuals that I planted about a month ago, and they're starting to bloom as well. You want to continue feeding any annuals, but stop feeding any perennials. You don't not you can water them, but do not feed perennials at this point because you want them to start hardening off for winter and not have a lot of soft new growth that would freeze when we do get that first freeze, which will happen in about two months. Black-eyed Susans, Veronica, still a little flocks available. We should have hydrangeas on that bush, but that bush does not seem to produce flowers. So that goes on the list as being removed. And we'll just write it in. I may try it in a different location, but very likely I will just get rid of it because it has not bloomed. It's been there about five years. It's had enough opportunity to do so, and it is clearly not happy. It's getting the proper nutrition. It's getting the proper light. It may be that it's just a variety that freezes a little too much in the winter and any bloom buds that are formed are frozen and hence we'd never get any blooms from it. I will replace it with one that will bloom on new wood instead of just old wood and hopefully get some blooms in the future, which would be very nice to have some nice blue blooms behind these black-eyed Susans. This area has some flocks, roses, a butterfly bush, and the tall verbena, verbena bonariensis, a mouthful for a little flower. I will also let that go to seed and spread some of the seeds in other areas so that I will have those tall spikes. They're kind of a see-through plant and they're very uh, nice at this time of year when not as much is blooming. It's kind of between the summer bloomers and the fall bloomers. We're still getting some summer bloomers. Moving along, I have more of the uh, lemon verbena, and I'm harvesting that. You can dry that for tea. It makes a lovely lemon tea. And aliums. There are some aliums that will bloom in the summer or into fall. Many of them bloom in the spring, so you need to really check if you want something that blooms in the fall. This is a chrysanthemum, and if you were with me, some of the episodes I did in the spring, 
You'll remember that I pinched these back until about July 1st, so that it would keep them bushy. I planted this one probably five years ago in the spring, and that's why it's returned each year. Planting chrysanthemums in the spring, they will return. I will put in more chrysanthemums about next month, but I will not uh, expect them to return. They just don't. Even though they're listed as hardy chrysanthemums, unless you plant them in the spring, they generally do not come back unless it's a very unusual year, in which case you may get one or two to return. This is an aster which will bloom soon or it might be another type of goldenrod. I have a feeling it is more of a weed than a plant, but I did leave it this year to see what it would do. Always fun to experiment a little bit. I have a few annuals in pots. This one is flowering tobacco, and this will reseed throughout the area. This is a lemongrass plant. It is a tender, tender perennial. It's not, it's uh, more appropriate to Southeast Asia, but we can grow it as an annual. This one is one I added this year. It's Vernonia, or New York ironweed and it's gonna have purple blooms. It's uh, filled with buds. There's only a few flowers out right now, but I thought it would be a nice addition to this area. And there's a nice hummingbird moth that's come to visit it. Sedum is uh, getting ready to bloom. Right now it's nice pale green. It will turn pink and then as fall, comes into the season, it will become a dark red. So it's a really good three or four season, season plant. Uh, you have the foliage in the spring to cover any mob foliage and that's dying back. And then you have the green uh, that turns to pink and then eventually to a deep red. I will continue anything that's finished. I have been uh, cutting back and putting in the compost, and anything, uh, any weeds that come up, I've been trying to get out. With the weather being very hot and humid, it's, it's really a push to get out here and weed, but it is necessary because each weed that goes to seed produces about 10,000 seeds. That means 10,000 more weeds next year. So it really helps everyone that you pull eases your job for the next few years. I've been vegetable gardening in the same location now for almost 40 years and weeding as regularly as I can. I still have some weeds, but I have a lot fewer than I did that first year. So it does make sense to keep up with the weeding. The weeds steal nutrients from the plants. They don't look very nice in the garden uh, around your other plants. And they do go to seed and produce tons of seedlings that will come up next year and the year after and the year after that because many of their seeds are very long-lived. Now let's go into the vegetable garden. The vegetable garden is turned into a jungle and it's a little hard to get around in here but everything seems to be growing well. I have flowers and herbs also planted in this garden. I have uh, marjoram and three different kinds of basil. And it's time to pick that to harvest it and uh, dry it. And also, this is dill. It's for starting to form seed heads, but there's still plenty of the lacy fronds to pick and dry for dill weed all year. If I want dill seed, I let these develop and harvest the seeds. I have peppers to pick, uh, cucumbers. Every rain brings a new humongous cucumber to the patch. And I do have my clippers to clip cucumbers and peppers. Sometimes if the soil's wet, you'll pull the whole plant if you start pulling too hard. We have a nice cucumber that we'll pick. And we have tomatoes and yellow squash, uh, zucchini squash, green and yellow beans, a variety of tomatoes. These are little uh, cherry, oblong cherry tomatoes which have been really good this year, and there's tons still on the 
bush. I have a variety of yellow tomatoes and these are some I got down on the town hill at the farmer's market from our friend Zach. And uh, these are a yellow, I think it, he said yellow uh, pear, to, or not yellow pear, a type of yellow tomato, yellow peach, yellow peach tomato. And they're very tasty. They're not large, but they're quite tasty. And then I have a variety of red tomatoes, heirloom tomatoes. We've been enjoying a lot of tomatoes and we'll be cooking with those today. But with every garden year comes a few disappointments. One of them has been my fennel. I had hoped for nice bulbs at the base of my fennel, but instead it's going to seed. So there will not be any bulbs of fennel from this crop. However, I can harvest the fennel foliage. Looks like we've had a black swallowtail in here harvesting some of the foliage, which is also good. That means we'll have more butterflies. But the foliage can be used as uh, fennel. And certainly the seeds also can be harvested for fennel seeds. I have arugula here, and I'm picking that for salads. It will soon be going to seed. And broccoli. I've left my plants because they will form side shoots, and the side shoots are very tasty. They aren't as large as, as the center head. And I do have a center head on this one. They have been eaten quite badly, but they're still performing, so we'll see what happens. Lots of flowers. I have nasturtiums, which are an edible flower, and also zinnias, which are not edible, but they're nice to have in the vase. And the more you pick a zinnia, the more they will divide and produce. So I'll be sure to just pick them and enjoy them in the vases this summer. I have a lot of calendulas on the other end of the garden, and they too are, are nice to pick, and they are edible and can be used as a saffron replacement, the petals, the yellow petals. They can also be used in cookies and other things and sprinkled on salads. They add a, a very little flavor, but a lot of color. This is celery, and some years celery does well, and this is one of them. We've had quite a lot of rain, so the celery is doing well. It prefers it a little wet. These are the seeds that we planted a couple weeks ago, and I'm gonna give them a little boost with some fish oil. And I've got two gallons of water here I'll add a quarter of a cup of the fish oil. Doesn't take too much. Something you don't want to use in the house. It works very well outdoors, but it does have quite an odor. So greenhouse or, or outside. And what I'll do is just water these little plants with some of the fish oil. The spinach in particular likes it a little cooler than it is today. Hopefully it's getting some shade from the tomatillos and the broccoli, but it also likes some extra nutrition. And this is the uh, mescalum mix, which is different greens and some lettuce as well. I also have some of these planted on the other side of the garden, some seedlings of lettuce and cilantro and chard, and they too will get a bit of this enriched watering before we're finished. The blueberries are finished and I can take off the netting at any time when I can get in among the tomatillos. And of course the rhubarb harvest is ready, is gone too. I do have some of the perpetual spinach in among the nasturtiums and we can pick that and use it as a spinach replacement. It's a very mild charred, charred family vegetable and it will stay in the garden all season. Spinach is either spring or fall, real spinach. But some of the uh, other greens can stand in very nicely for spinach in salads and baked dishes. Now, let's see if we can get out and go do some cuttings. I'm gonna take more cuttings of the plants that I use in my containers. And there are quite a few, and they don't always grow but uh, I will definitely want to take cuttings of coleus. 
coleus grows fairly large and I'm just going to take the top parts of a few of the plants and I have two, three varieties in here actually that I will take and I can always take more cuttings later. The more you water this the more it keeps growing and I also have the cuttings that I took out in the herb garden and I can go around the garden with some of the other containers and geraniums particularly and take cuttings of those. These are things I know grow pretty well and they go from year to year. I've not bought these, I bought the uh, dark veined coleus this year but the other two have kept going for about four years just using cuttings. And I've set up a tray with little pots full of compost. Dropping them. And I'm going to use a rooting powder, though you probably don't even need it with coleus. It roots very easily. But if you use the rooting powder, you want to put some into a separate container to use it. You don't want to dip your plant material into the jar because you'll contaminate the jar if it sits around for a while. The next thing we want to do is take off the lower leaves of the plant. And I may even want to take off these. And I'll just make a pile of leaves. And you want to cut the stem just below where some leaves were. And then dip it in the rooting powder. And I'm going to make a hole in the uh, compost that's in the pot. It's damp from rain last night. And I'll make maybe three holes in each pot and put in three cuttings. And again, we take off the lower leaves, dip it in rooting powder, and add it into the hole in the pot. This one needs a little trimming. Now with the plain one, we can cut that a little bit higher. New roots will form at this spot where the leaves were. A pencil makes a good uh, thing for making a little hole. And again, don't want too many leaves. If you have really fat leaves, you can also just cut them in half while the plant is getting rooted. Those leaves will eventually come off as new leaves grow. But again, we dip it and put it in the pot. And you can plant one, two, or three starts. Last year I did too many, so this year most all of them grew. So this year I'm going to cut back a little and not do quite as many. I can always do some later on. Into, as the season progresses, if these do not take, I'll have time by starting early. This is a uh, peppermint geranium. nutmeg geranium. If you grow your own scented geraniums from cuttings, you'll find that you can add more well, with less strain on the budget because you've already grown some from last year's cuttings. You can add different varieties next year and the year after and have plenty to grow.
I've never had as much luck with uh, lemon verbena, though it is one of my favorite plants, but it's always worth a try. I had never had much luck with rosemary until last year, and I was able to grow a substantial rosemary plant. So we'll try a pot of lemon verbena. I can also do things like fuchsia and geraniums. And again, this is damp soil. And I want to keep that soil damp as we go. We'll water them in. And keep a watering can nearby, just plain water, no fertilizer, just plain water for now. And in another week or so, we should uh, be able to tug on one and see that it's formed roots. I'll keep adding to this until I have a full tray. This tray then will come in under lights. Uh, when the weather gets colder, I'll discard any that don't grow. And any that do grow, I can put in individual pots to bring in. Or put them in individual pots after I get them in. That's the usual way of things. I usually don't get around to dividing them up until a little later. But cuttings are always good to have in the spring. Uh, you can also do it with Plectoranthus very easily. Uh, other plants in containers. Uh, geraniums especially work well. And you can have geraniums for pennies by dividing a plant into the next season. You can also save the mother plant by cutting, it, cutting all the pieces off of it. You'll get new growth, and then you'll have your cuttings. So you can turn one geranium plant into six or eight plants for next year, if you have a good sunny spot to hold them over the winter. I'm going to continue to feed my annuals. And this is just a, a fertilizer that can be uh, diluted. I don't use it in the garden, but on my house plants and annuals I do. And I'll continue to feed these annuals. The canna that is blooming in the middle started out, if you'll remember, with just a little corm in the ground. And now it's uh, about four feet tall. Some of them are even taller than that, or can get taller. And definitely want to continue feeding any window boxes. In the hot weather they wilt very quickly. And you can keep the blooms going. As it cools down, I'm hoping some of the pansies that are still in here will come back. Petunias are still blooming. And the alyssum. And in mentioning cuttings, these are some that I took several months ago, and I have probably six new geraniums in this pot, one of which is blooming and one has a bud. So I will have plenty of white geraniums for next year if I can man manage to keep these going throughout the winter in my sunny room, sunroom. It does work. Now let's head back briefly to the back shade garden because it's cooler back there and today is a hot day. <laughs> Back in the shade garden, and it's decidedly cooler back here, I think by about 20 degrees than out in the sun. I'm feeding the fish, and they've learned to come over to this area to be fed. They know the food is coming. They're quite active when the weather is warm. We also have frogs, and uh, one of our little games is to come out and see how many we can find. They hide in the rocks around the edges of the pond, and uh, Right now I can see two. Of course, one's pretty obvious, but I'm betting there's probably four or five in here. I've counted up to five at one time. They hide very well. Uh, sometimes they go into the foliage around the edge of the pond, and then you can't see them. But in the pond itself, they'll often be three or four, and you just have to look, have a sharp eye, and then you can see them. We have two different kinds of frogs living in this pond. Uh, leopard frogs, which are very predominantly spotted and brown stripes and spots, 
and the green frog and he has a bright chartreuse throat and that's the one that's sitting here on the uh, skimmer cover and I see a leopard frog which is down in the rocks and maybe our camera person can get a good view of him a little later not much to do in the shade garden except pick up things that have gone by there are a few things that are left to bloom I do have a uh, oat grass that will turn beige and uh, be a nice fall companion. I'm thinking about fall. I also have a Keringshioma plant, which I will show you when it does bloom. It has a pretty insignificant yellow bloom, but nice leaves throughout the season. And this is a young one, so I'm hoping it will bush out. I left the uh, bloom stalks on the astelbe. It's probably gone to seed, and I may have more astelbe. We have buds on the turtle head, and again, that will be a white bloom. Right now, the big color show are the annuals that are in the pots, and again, they need to be watered and fertilized regularly in order to keep blooming. And they'll bloom until the first hard frost, and one day I'll come out and find that they're completely droopy and gone. But that could be another two months, so I do want to keep them watered and fertilized now. It is time to think about making preparations for fall if you do have a pond, if you, uh, because you will need to winterize it. Make sure that you have an ice melter. I have a unit that plugs in and keeps a hole in the ice so that the fish will be alive. Obviously, if you don't have any fish in your pond, you won't need it. But if you do, you need to keep a hole to exhaust any gases that form that could kill the fish. The other thing I put on is a net. And you can see I have a few leaves in the pond already. Uh, the skimmer can do only so much as far as taking out debris. I have my pond in the shade garden, probably not a great idea, but I do enjoy it back here. I don't have algae problems, but I do have leaf problems, and I need to put a net over it in another month at least. When the leaves start really falling to some degree, then I'll net the pond so that the leaves don't go in it as much. We still get a few, but not nearly as much. The fish will be here and they'll stay all winter and do very well. They just uh, go into suspended animation. Right now I'm feeding them several times a day. As it gets cooler, they get fed once a day. Then it'll be two or three times a week. And then after the temperatures drop in the water to below 50 degrees, we will not feed them at all. And they will kind of go into semi-hibernation. They don't really hibernate, but uh, they do swim very, very slowly under the ice. Now, we have a good harvest in our vegetable garden. Let's go in and see what we can make with it as our dinner tonight and perhaps even another night or two. Today we're gonna work in the kitchen on a few things from my garden, but also a few things from other people's gardens, like corn and peaches, both things that I don't grow. So I will be using those in the preparations today. I want to make a peach cake because it is peach season and peaches are wonderful just as they are but they're also very nice in baked goods. So I'm going to start with a half a cup of softened butter in my mixer bowl and I'll add one cup of sugar and beat that well. And I'm going to be adding two eggs I'll add them one at a time because I'll need to scrape down the bowl a little in between. Add the other one. Scrape it down again, and then I'll add a half, a, one cup of sour cream and a teaspoon of vanilla. And I've mixed the vanilla in with the sour cream. 
Then two cups of flour. One teaspoon of baking powder, one teaspoon of baking soda, and a half teaspoon of salt. And we'll just mix these until they're combined. And then we can get the mixer out of the way. And scrape off the beater. Meanwhile, I'm preheating the oven to 350 degrees. I'm going to put about half of the batter into a greased 9-inch cake pan. You could also use a 9-inch square pan. That would also work. And I'm going to spread that into the pan. Maybe add a little bit more. I've pitted and peeled and sliced three good sized peaches, medium to large. And I'm going to add half of those to the top of the batter. Spread them out. I prepared the peaches a little in advance. And if you prepare peaches in advance, perhaps you're just having sliced peaches as dessert, uh, always add a little lemon juice to help keep them bright in color. A couple more in this layer. This is a half cup of sugar and a teaspoon of cinnamon. And I'm going to mix that well. And then put about two-thirds of this mixture on top of the peaches. Spread it around. If your peaches are really sweet, you might even want to use a little less of the sugar. But keep the cinnamon. Then we'll add the rest of the batter. Get a little more batter in here in spots. And then layer on the rest of the peaches. And sprinkle with the rest of the cinnamon sugar mixture. And I'm going to add a quarter cup of chopped nuts. These are walnuts, but pecans I think would be very good. And you could even leave them in larger, slightly larger pieces. And then we're going to bake that in a 350 degree oven for about 50 to 55 minutes. I'm going to set the timer for 50 minutes. One of the things I've seen pictures of online and in magazines are cookies with flowers embedded in them. And so I really kind of wanted to try that. And right now I have a lot of edible flowers in the garden. And uh, some of them are appropriate for cookies. Others would be more appropriate for biscuits or crackers. Things like chives I don't think I'd want to put on a cookie. But uh, certainly the lemony ones and the nasturtiums and rose petals all would be really nice on cookies. So I made some shortbread dough, and this is just a plain 
shortbread dough, butter, sugar, flour, and I put in a little vanilla. And I'm going to roll it quite thick to start. After trying it once, I refined my technique a little bit. And then I'm going to stick on some flower petals here and there. And nasturtium, one petal is all I need because I've only got a small cookie cutter that I'm going to use on them. So we'll do a couple of yellow ones and press it down. Borage flowers. They're very pretty and uh, I thought they'd look nice on the cookies. They do have a slight cucumber flavor. You could probably use them also on savory ones. And I still have a few violas in the garden. Those would be nice. These are Mexican mint marigolds, something I tried new this year. And uh, they're just starting to bloom, so I have a few little flower buds of those. We'll do a couple more of the pansies and violas are always good. And then we can use some whole small calendulas and rose petals, single rose petals, and a few of the orange calendulas. Uh, calendulas come in, or I'm sorry, nasturtiums come in all uh, different hot colors, red, orange, yellow, minor orange and yellow. Some of them are even white. I don't think white flowers would work well in this particular application. I think they would tend to turn brown. And what else do we have? A variety here. And then I'm going to put a piece of wax paper right on top of the dough and roll the flowers in to the dough. My original recipe suggested cutting them first and then rolling it, but I lost the shape of the cookies, so I decided to finish rolling it with the flower petals in it and that it would work much better. And then I can go ahead and cut the cookies. and add them to the baking sheet. This dough, because it has such a high content of butter, can easily be re-rolled. So you can definitely get probably at least six more cookies out of it eventually. These will go in a 325 degree oven and only about eight to ten minutes. You don't want them to get brown, too brown. You want a little browning on the bottom, but not too much browning or your uh, flowers will burn. So they will go in the oven and uh, if they pop up you can uh, open the oven door and press them down again. But these seem to be embedded pretty well. And then we'll show you what they look like when they come out of the oven. The next thing I'm going to make is the main dish, and that is a Mexican-inspired zucchini tacos. I'm going to start out with a tablespoon and a half, approximately, of olive oil in my pan, and I'm heating that up. And I'm going to add then a cup of onion and saute that, probably for four or five minutes. We want it kind of richly browned. Okay, the onions are getting nice and brown, and I'm going to add the garlic. And this is uh, two cloves of garlic that's been peeled and chopped. And we'll add that in, and that only needs to be cooked for about a minute. And while it's cooking, I'm going to puree two large tomatoes. And I uh, just poured these and uh, put them in the blender and we'll just kind of loosely puree them. And then when that garlic is cooked, we'll add the tomatoes. And turn the heat down a little. all this tomatoey goodness in.
And I'm gonna cover this and let it cook for about five minutes, just on simmer. Okay, I'm gonna uncover the pan and add some more ingredients. The first thing I'm gonna add are two poblamo peppers that I have broiled under the broiler, or you can use a barbecue grill, and till they have the skin completely blackened. And then you peel off the skin and take out the seeds. And, oh, after you have them in the, uh, under the broiler, you need to wrap them in a towel for about five minutes. The steam will loosen the skin so that it peels right off. And then you can cut them up and put them in the dish. I'm going to add about five cups of zucchini cubes. And I have peeled it. You don't have to, unless there's someone in your family, too, that doesn't like zucchini peeling. Corn that's been cut off, one cob of fresh sweet corn. Oh, let's get it all out. About three tablespoons of cilantro, fresh from the garden. And a half a cup of black beans, just because it's a Mexican dish and I think beans go with it well. And two thirds of a cup either heavy cream or cream fraiche. Heavy cream's a little easier to come by. And then we're going to stir this around and let it cook for about eight minutes until the zucchini is cooked, at which point the corn will also be cooked. And we want the sauce to thin a little bit just to coat the vegetables. Time to plate up things. Our uh, zucchini is tender crisp and we're going to put this mixture into a serving bowl. And it's going to fill it quite nicely. Perhaps even overfill it. Extra there, and I need to wipe up what we spilled. The final ingredient is uh, crumbled feta cheese on top, about half a cup, and that's going to melt right into it. And I'm going to garnish this with some of the nasturtium flowers, just because they're there, they're edible, and they are kind of bright and cheerful. And we can get out a plate and we serve this with corn tacos. I'll get out a dinner plate here. Unwrap my tacos. These can be heated in the microwave, and if you're going to heat them in the microwave, uh, use a damp paper towel so that they don't dry out and get crispy. Uh, these are going to be a, a knife and fork dish, certainly. And I'm going to serve those with two other ingredients. One is some lime slices, just to uh, give a little flavor of lime. And the other is an avocado. And I'm going to just slice up the avocado. This one is quite ripe. You never know quite how ripe they are until you open them up. And one of the ways to get them out is to use a grapefruit knife. This usually helps get them out of the shell and then you can cut them in pieces. This one is very ripe. And put those into the dish. And I'm, I like to get every bit out that I can because I really like it. You could actually uh, mash it and make some uh, guacamole with it. But grapefruit knives can be used on a lot of things. Squash, for instance, if you want to pull the seeds out. 
I use it on pineapples that I want to cut up. Anything with the, a shape that you need to go around with a, a knife like that. A grapefruit knife works pretty well. We don't eat much grapefruit, but uh, we do use the grapefruit knife. Now, if you're going to be holding avocado for any length of time, it will turn very brown unless you mix it and sprinkle it with lime or lemon juice to help it hold its color and keep it from oxidizing. The acid in the lemon juice will do that. So we have avocado to serve with it. And peach cake. You can kind of rearrange this stuff a little bit. We have a peach cake over here that can be cut. And a nice uh, finish for the peach cake is just a little caramel ice cream syrup drizzled on it. Or, if you wish, you can use a confectioner's sugar sifted over it. Get rid of some of our bits and pieces. And here are the flour cookies. I wouldn't necessarily serve both, but since I made them, we will put them out. And we'll put a little of the taco mixture on the plate on our corn tortilla. Finish the whole thing off with a bright flower arrangement. And a colorful napkin. Well, we have Mexican zucchini tacos and peach cake. And this has been A Walk in the Garden with Liz Davey on Norfolk Community Cable Television and CTV. Join me again next time as we walk in the garden, pick a few things, and then come in the kitchen and prepare them. <laughs>